All right, so Blake, we have you with us today. You want to get some feedback on your track here, Rocket Fuel. Um, right before we get into this, actually, why don't you let me know, is this a full album ready to be pitched to a library? Um, why, why are we listening to this track? Why, why is this track the one you want me to get you some notes on? Well, I got accepted to a library in Spain, and um, we're trying to work out right now which album we're going to start with. Um, them put, putting on their side probably going to be the first one deep fake rock instrumentals <laughs> which is thematically joined you know it's it's all classic rock stuff where i'm pretending to be led zeppelin and the who in boston stuff the second one is a stylistic sampler because i know this violates everything you know about the universe but my specialty is organic music. It's not rock or country or anything because I've been immersed in most of that stuff most of my life, you know, living in Latin America of 12 years and playing in punk rock bands and, uh, and lots of country bands, et cetera. So this one is part of the second album, the stylistic sampler and kind of old school metal and I've listened to it so many times and worked on it so much that I can't hear it objectively. And I don't know if it's amazing or if it sucks <laughs> or both, very possibly both. All right, well, let's take a listen, man. I'm gonna go ahead and tee it up here and let's see what you got going on here. <laughs> Okay, what I love already about it is that you just started the track, boom, directly into something really exciting and set the pace and the mood and just got us really into the meat of what this track is going to deliver. A lot of producers will meander for 10 or 20 seconds in the beginning of their track and trying to give this big epic intro and all the while we have no idea what they're getting into. So if this is a formula that you followed for most of this album, then you you did something right. Because a lot of times what these um, supervisors and editors will do is they'll just click play for a couple of seconds and just try to find something or sometimes just skip through the track. But a lot of times it's just the first couple of seconds they're hitting down arrow just to go to the next track. And if you're not delivering them what you are going to promise for the rest of the track immediately, sometimes they don't get it and they just move on. So, so far that's a really great uh, plus you got. So let's listen more. Mix-wise, um, one thing I'm noticing is your snare is really hot. It's actually probably the most dominant instrument in the track. Um, it sounds good, though. Your drums sound good. The, the um, uh, guitars could probably have a little bit more mid-range presence to them. Right now, they feel a little bit hollow and a little bit tinny, kind of in the high end. Like, they're really more focused on the high frequencies. So I want a little bit more, you know, gut, bassy kind of presence in this track. Right now, it just doesn't feel like it has that. Uh, definitely has a cool, fun, rockabilly, great energy, so you're definitely nailing that. But I think the mix is a little bit unbalanced. So going back to the snare, I would say probably take down that snare a little bit and probably bring up the um, the guitars a little bit. They feel like they're actually a little bit buried in this mix. And let me listen a little bit more for the bass. I wasn't quite picking up on the bass yet. <music> bass is cool. I like the bass where you're going with that, so let's listen more. One issue I'm already feeling though is that this might be a very complex track, which in some ways is a compliment, but in the sync licensing world, sometimes libraries are going to not know what to do with extremely complex tracks. So you have these really cool leads and riffs in here, but they are very complex and they are moving, moving very quickly. And I'm not really getting a thematic hook yet that I'm hearing. So that's there's something missing from this track. So I know this sometimes rubs musicians the wrong way and especially rock musicians, which is, you know, nobody wants to hear, can you like dumb it down a little bit? But unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, uh, groove and, and something that kind of sticks with you is so important in the TV film world. Um, and I know this because I've made this mistake. I've made lots of music that was way too complex and way too complicated. And libraries I worked with might have liked it personally, but they said, we don't know what to throw this at. We couldn't get this placed. 
So you're skirting on the edge here a little bit of just kind of, it's just wild music, you know what I'm saying? So it might be something that you want to just keep in mind moving forward. I think this track can be licensable. I think it's got this really cool wild feeling to it. So I think there's a place for this. But um, when you were putting together this album, was there an album in a library that you had modeled this offer after? Was there um, like some reference tracks you were going for? Or how did you come up with the concept for this stuff? Hmm, well, uh, I wrote the thing in Venezuela years ago. I, I was just um, playing the guitar and it... Uh, it's um, like the the harmony guitars you'll hear later are kind of maybe an Iron Maiden sort of a thing. Uh, I'm old, you know, and like uh, some of it was influenced by some of the Tommy Aldridge type stuff that he did with Pat Travers or Ozzy. Um, but uh, it's it's it wouldn't fall into the deep fake rock instrumentals album that I have up there at the top. So um, I was just trying to do something extreme you know like extreme sports and, and i have another track that you won't hear that um it's along these same lines only it doesn't have all of the like 16th note triplets and stuff going on quite so much and um and probably has a little more mids to the guitar i did scoop them very heavily and i think i over scooped yeah and that might have been the, the case there so um I think really what this comes down to is this was obviously created in a time before you were probably looking at sync licensing. So that's why this might be something that hopefully you can find a home for it. And if you can't, it might be one of those things where you got to find another place for it. So uh, I want, you know, everybody who's a part of this business to understand this, that like, you know, even though many of us have hundreds of tracks that we've had, you know, that we've produced over the years, and then we find out about sync licensing, it's like, great, I have a home for all this stuff. And it's like, well maybe but sometimes and more often than not it's no and i know that really pisses off a lot of people and it really bums them out but i just want to be honest with you guys that it is a very particular type of industry that you have to really go to these companies research them know what kind of music that they're um doing i know with you you're in sync edge so you obviously have, have seen these companies and you can hear their music all right with all the videos that you get access to but that's really the way to make sure that you're not just sort of stabbing in the dark and just like, well, this is kind of what I think might be useful for this library. Because when you come to them with this guessing stuff, you really are, it's a 50-50 gamble. And I think it's even less, the odds are even less in your favor that way. Whereas opposed to if you go to a library, let's say you're going to look up like rockabilly or, you know, extreme rock or electronic rock or whatever it is you want to do. Well, where we're better than to find uh, music you should follow than from the library you want to work with and exactly in their catalog of going, wow, they've already accepted quite a few tracks in this style and this is what they've said is okay and acceptable for them. It's on their website. They've accepted it. This is where I'm going to go and this is how I'm going to model my music. So that's the way to cut out all the guessing and cut out all the, well, I hope this is, is this licensable? Is it not? If you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I've modeled this music after stuff that's already been accepted by this library, and I honestly believe that mine is on par, if not better, than what they've got. Then you know you got something licensable. You don't have to get my opinion. You don't have to get anybody else's opinion. You've you've done your research. You've done your work, and then you know, even if they do pass on it, you at least still know. I know that I have something high quality though, because that was a high quality library. Maybe they just haven't, didn't have a place for me, but I know there's going to be another home for it. So. I All wish right. you the best with this one. We'll keep going. I can give you some more notes, but it's just one of those things that, you know, you just never know with pre-made stuff that was made in an era before. Uh, hopefully it works out, but sometimes it doesn't, but we'll go ahead and uh, keep going here. this stop here this is a really good thing that you're doing here around 120 um you're stopping the track you're just boom da, 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 and letting it rest and having these new you know this riff come in and having some accents and stuff this is the kind of stuff that you definitely want to include in almost every rock track that you put together so you're definitely doing something right here um some producers again they will want to have the same beat playing throughout the entire two or three minute long track and there's no breaks no pauses no parts that just go like 
ah, let's take a little breath and then we can get back into the groove. So I like that I'm hearing this, man. So that's another plus. One thing I will point out, I feel like we've heard this riff before, and I don't know if there's much difference from the first time we heard it. It kind of feels like exactly the same. There might have been a little pad or something on top, but it really doesn't sound different enough to me. So if we're ever going to repeat, like copy and paste a verse, a chorus, anything, and like repeat it again later in the track, we better add something else to it, right? A different drum beat, uh, a new lead, change up the guitar riff a little bit. So. We don't need to be giving them repeats of earlier parts of our track. They've got a copy and paste function on their computer. They can take that 16 bars and just loop it as many times as they want to. So just always remember that when you're repeating, especially riffs and that kind of thing, just go, hmm, have we heard this before? Yes. Uh, what can I add to really just sort of add a dynamic to this and build on top of it or change it in some significant way? So the editor has two different options. They can take this version of that riff or that version of that riff, right? So you wanna just give them kind of multiple tracks within one track. We'll keep going. Uh, drum programming them in um i don't know how, which which program are you using to do your drums i think this one i use superior drummer three yeah really nice chops there man sounds really good again they're just too loud that's really all it is the drums are just kind of like you know really coming out of the track and just dominating everything but great programming and i like that you took the time to do that intricate amount of work for those those fills um that that's those are those little things that will separate you from everybody else a lot of people will just go you know, and they'll just kind of use the same riff, the same fill rather, every eight bars, and they don't really reinvent something and, and create something new. So this is a cool um, way to just show that like, you're putting a little bit of extra time. It might have taken you a couple of extra minutes to do something like that, but it does really show and speak to the uh, the volume and the, uh, not the volume, the, the uh, value of the track and how high quality it is. So yeah, definitely something to keep doing. So let's finish it up here. Cool. Yeah, man, I like it. I could, I could even hear that ending going a little bit bigger. Um, I like that you did create a little bit of a, you know, a, a, you know, like a definite ending there with some sort of like uh, punchy hits. Um, but I kind of wanted to hear it even a little bit longer. I felt like it was just sort of like jammed onto the end of the track, and then it was, it was over far too quickly. So I don't know what you could do, but just dun 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 Boom, you know, something like that, where it just gives it a little bit more final, final punch, like really just nail that down to the ground um and just give it that final ending and maybe even like if you can add like a high octave kind of squeal to the very last hit or something just have a nice big thing of exclamation marks at the end of your track with like big fireworks going off essentially so you want to have some highs some big punchy lows that kind of thing so uh but the idea is there but i think you can just go a little bit above and beyond it so um yeah man those are my general thoughts i think it's in a direction that can be licensable again just some of those things about it being very complicated not having much of a, a hook um, a melodic hook or so or kind of a groove that I was kind of really being sold, really. I think there's a little bit more that you can do there. It's really, it's like one of those things where less is more, right? Where you have kind of a more simple riff, more simple groove, uh, simple leads, that kind of thing. But they just, they catch you a little bit more and they sort of deliver the energy, you know, a little bit more. So, um, and in, in that direction you're going in, you could even go a little bit more like electronic, but you would obviously then need to swap out all those drums for an EDM, you know, electronic kit essentially and have more of an EDM thing. So that'd be a completely different direction if you wanted to go there. So anyways, man, do you have any uh, further questions? Yeah, well, I mean, an observation, I, um, I, I was aware of the fact that I was just repeating the same riff later on and there wasn't a lot of room for, say, something slower and melodic. So I started slathering guitars on there, you know, the Iron Maiden, like, sustained harmony stuff. And then on the third time around, there's three guitars instead of two, but I can see that that would probably satisfy me more than a music supervisor for someone like that. 
That is really powerful right there, man. And that's what most producers are getting in trouble. And <laughs> why they're getting in trouble is they can't get out of their own way. So they really just want to make music that they want to do. And they and for them, it feels, hey, this is, you know, I, I added something. This is definitely different. But you also got to realize that, like, we're not in it for ourselves. We're not the only ones in this entire industry. In fact, what a library thinks is going to be licensable is way more valuable than what I think is because they're the ones to, hosting my music, right? They're the ones that their job is to only do that all day long is to find out what track would be licensable for their clients. They don't make the music. They're not involved with any of that creative process. They have a completely different creative sort of business process. So I think you're very wise to recognize that to say like, yeah, sometimes my preferences and what I think is going to be acceptable might not be exactly what the library wants or is going to think is okay. Um, or is going to be delivering those options as I talked about. And it's okay for me to you know, change essentially and to kind of open myself up into reinterpreting how I want to build and develop my track. So it's got to be, you know, like I said, I heard you had a, a pad on top of that second time the riff came in. So yeah, a little different, but again, it's like, it's one of those things where it's kind of like the lazy man's approach, right? Where it's like, well, I put a couple of little, there's some ethereal pad on top of it. It's technically different. Yes, it's technically different than the first time, but when I hear it, do I get a different feeling? No, it's pretty much the same exact feeling, right? So if your drums were maybe more intense or more laid back, like maybe you went to a halftime with the drums, right? Like like physically, I would feel the difference because I'd be like, oh, whoa, we're kind of grooving now to this as opposed to just, you know, rock and roll, rock and roll, going really, really fast. So that's what I mean is like it should feel completely different. And sometimes changing up the drum beat can do that. Sometimes adding some pauses, some breaks. You know, there's a, there's so many creative ways to do it. So, you know, I always leave you guys with those choices to make there. But yeah, definitely make it extremely obvious when you have a repeat that this is a completely different version of this. So you can choose which one you want to use as, a, as an editor or supervisor. Yeah, I mean, because you know, I opened up the hi-hat, got a little more slushy the second time around. But who notices that? Two drummers, you know. You you did. I didn't even notice that. So that's what I'm saying. So if, uh, if, if and I'm a drummer too, and I didn't even notice it. But, you know, my first time listen... It's got to be obvious. That's a great point that, you know, we, we need to make these changes extremely obvious so that anybody hearing it for the first time, because and the other thing that happens is that when I think we're so used to the radio format where it's like, hey, you got a verse and a chorus, and then we want to repeat that chorus, and then we repeat that chorus, right? But even they switch up the second and the third chorus. There's always new voices and new things being done. But I think we're so used to that. So we just think, okay, well, I I have a verse. I did a chorus. Here's my next verse. So I guess I'll just copy paste and put that, right? That's where it belongs. But when we don't have vocals on our tracks, we have to do all that heavy lifting. We have to tell that story and we got to change things around somehow musically. So it is important to remember that you're trying to pull your listener along for a ride, for a two or three minute long ride, essentially. And so how do you do that? Well, if you give them the same thing or something so similar, they've already heard it before, chances are... They're probably not going to be extremely excited about going on this ride because it's like being on a roller coaster and you've already been on the drop. And it's like, well, I already, I've already done it, right? I already know what's going to happen. So the, the element of surprise is a really powerful thing to kind of include in your music so that you're always bringing that listener to go, we're going to rise up. And, and one thing you can also do in this track, which I didn't hear, maybe you do it in other tracks, is more dynamics in terms of having a part where it's completely just, just the bass then build up with some drums, then get in with the guitar and then rise us up into a big, cool groove and then let us come back down again. So really thinking more dynamics. Um, you that think of it as a big, go ahead. Um, you, you'd hear a lot of that in my other stuff. That's okay. the only metal track on on both of, of the albums, really. You know? Perfect. Then, I'm yeah. really a country guitar player, which leads to my last question because we have 40 seconds left, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's like with, with country, you know, obviously there's a lot of lead instrument stuff going on, whether it's guitar, mandolin, banjo, whatever. And I have some of that on the website. And that seems like it'd be a little harder to to weed out if you were targeting a, like a country thing. Because I'm in real life, I'm a country guitar player. So I'm not sure what's the question. Oh, um, whether this... Uh, issue of busy leads um would spill over into a, a busy... oh yeah same same issue in country so like there are going to be country songs where it's really really complicated like for a solo or something like that i can understand yeah you're going to probably go yeah solos should be solos but i'm kind of talking more about what is there can be a more simplified uh, uh, hook with your lead guitar or steel guitar or whatever you do so there should be something when we listen to a, a country song 
that just kind of gives us this, um, like a theme, right? If you don't want to call it a hook or whatever, just like a theme, a melodic theme that can kind of stay with you and make you feel good or make you feel whatever it is you want them to feel sad or happy or reflective or remorseful. So yeah, it is about, um, a, a, you know, like it or hate it, uh, less is more in every genre. Like a lot of times throwing so much stuff into it because it's like, well, I'll impress them with how complicated my riffs and my drums are. It's like, I just, I've seen it, I've seen so many producers come and go with that approach and it just does not impress anybody. It might, I mean, personally, it might impress some people to go, wow, this is really cool music. But in terms of business wise, it's just not an approach that really libraries are going to grab you and go like, yes, we want this very complicated music because we can find homes for it. In my experience and what I've seen out there, it just doesn't work out. So um, it doesn't mean you have to make dumb music or you have to make music <laughs> that's not, you know, inspiring or emotional. Simple music or groovy music can have very powerful no emotions and really and, and it can be amazing beautiful awesome music and i think that actually a lot of times it's the simplest stuff that actually moves us the most actually so oh, in yeah. a way i'd see it as if that's a struggle for you or you know anybody it's like try to see it as a challenge to say okay i'm not used to this but it doesn't mean that i'm like sort of uh, going backwards as a producer it means i'm actually going forwards and i'm going to try to learn something new and try something that might get better results for me in this particular business you know if you're trying to make music and just Put it out for the internet do whatever you want right like i have no opinion on that of course but when it comes to licensing and libraries yeah i think less is more is what we should be looking for yeah, you probably find a lot of my stuff to be along the lines of what you just said but i i busted myself i threw one out there that's billions of nat notes so <laughs> anyway i i've spent so much time on that track i'll probably just put it aside and go on to the next one Usually a smart idea, man. So, well, I appreciate your time today, Blake, and uh, best of luck with this track, man, and this whole uh, album. Oh. I hope you find a home for it.